playback. It was the perfect murder. Perfect, that is, so far as the loathing and Borders police were concerned. The murderer had telephoned in to confess, had then panicked and attempted to flee, only to be caught leaving the scene of the crime. End of story. Except that now he was pleading innocence, pleading, yelling, and screaming it. And this worried Detective Inspector John Rebus, worried him all the way from his office to the four-story tenement in Leith's trendy dockside area. The tenements here were much as they were in any working-class area of Edinburgh, except that they boasted colour-splash roller blinds or Chinese-style bamboo affairs at their windows. And their grimy stone facades had been power-cleaned, their doors now boasting intruder-proof intercoms, a far cry from the greasy Venetian blinds and kicked-in passageways of the tenements in Easter Road or Gorgi. Or even in nearby parts of Leith itself, the parts the developers were ignoring as yet. The victim had worked as a legal secretary. This much Rebus knew. She had been twenty-four years old. Her name was Moira Bitter. Reba smiled at that. It was a guilty smile, but at this hour of the morning any smile he could raise was something of a miracle. He parked in front of the tenement, guided by a uniformed officer who had recognized the badly dented front bumper of Rebus's car. It was rumored that the dent had come from knocking down too many old ladies, and who was Rebus to deny it? It was the stuff of legend, and it gave him prominence in the fearful eyes of the younger recruits. A curtain twitched in one of the ground-floor windows, and Rebus caught a glimpse of an elderly lady. Every tenement, it seemed, tarted up or not, boasted its elderly lady. Living alone with one dog or four cats for company, she was her building's eyes and ears. As Rebus entered the hallway, a door opened and the old lady stuck out her head. He was going to run for it, she whispered. But the bobby caught him. I saw it. Is the young lass dead? Is that it? Her lips were pursed in keen horror. Rebus smiled at her, but said nothing. She would know soon enough. Already she seemed to know as much as he did himself. That was the trouble with living in a city the size of a town, a town with a village mentality. He climbed the four flights of stairs slowly, listening all the while to the report of the constable, who was leading him inexorably towards the corpse of Moira Bitter. They spoke in an undertone. Stairwell walls had ears. The call came at about 5 a.m., sir, explained P.C. McManus. The caller gave his name as John McFarlane and said he'd just murdered his girlfriend. He sounded distressed by all accounts, and I was radioed to investigate. As I arrived, a man was running down the stairs. He seemed in a state of shock. Shock? Sort of disorientated, sir. Did he say anything? asked Rebus. Yes, sir, he told me. Thank God you're here. Moira's dead. I then asked him to accompany me upstairs to the flat in question, called in for assistance, and the gentleman was arrested. Rebus nodded. McManus was a model of efficiency, not a word out of place, the tone just right. Everything by rote and without the interference of too much thought. He would go far as a uniformed officer, but Rebus doubted the young man would ever make CID. When they reached the fourth floor, Rebus paused for breath, then walked into the flat. The hall's pastel color scheme extended to the living room and bedroom. Mute colors, subtle and warming, 
There was nothing subtle about the blood, though. The blood was copious. Moira Bitter lay sprawled across her bed, her chest a riot of colour. She was wearing apple-green pyjamas, and her hair was silky blonde. The police pathologist was examining her head. She's been dead about three hours, he informed Rebus. Stabbed three or four times with a small sharp instrument which, for the sake of convenience, I'm going to term a knife. I'll examine her properly later on. Rebus nodded and turned to McManus, whose face had a sickly grey tinge to it. Your first time? Rebus asked. The constable nodded slowly. Never mind, Rebus continued. You never get used to it anyway. Come on. He led the constable out of the room and back into the small hallway. This man we've arrested. What did you say his name was? John McFarlane, sir, said the constable, taking deep breaths. He's the deceased's boyfriend, apparently. You said he seemed in a state of shock. Was there anything else you noticed? The constable frowned, thinking. Such as, sir, he said at last. Blood, said Rebus coolly. You can't stab someone in the heat of the moment without getting blood on you. McManus said nothing. Definitely not CID material, and perhaps realizing it for the very first time. Rebus turned from him and entered the living room. It was almost neurotically tidy. Magazines and newspapers in their rack beside the sofa. A chrome and glass coffee table bearing nothing more than a clean ashtray and a paperback romance. It could have come straight from an ideal home exhibition. No family photographs, no clutter. This was the lair of an individualist. No ties with the past, a present ransacked wholesale from Habitat Next. There was no evidence of a struggle, no evidence of an encounter of any kind, no glasses or coffee cups. The killer had not loitered, or else had been very tidy about his business. Rebus went into the kitchen. It too was tidy. Cups and plates stacked for drying beside the empty sink. On the draining board were knives, forks, teaspoons. No murder weapon. There were spots of water in the sink and on the draining board itself, yet the cutlery and crockery were dry. Rebus found a dish towel hanging up behind the door and felt it. It was damp. He examined it more closely. There was a small smudge on it. Perhaps gravy or chocolate. Or blood. Someone had dried something recently. But what? He went to the cutlery drawer and opened it. Inside, amidst the various implements, was a short-bladed chopping knife with a heavy black handle. A quality knife, sharp and gleaming. The other items in the drawer were bone dry, but this chopping knife's wooden handle was damp to the touch. Rebus was in no doubt he had found his murder weapon. Clever of McFarlane, though, to have cleaned and put away the knife. A cool and calm action. Moira Bitta had been dead three hours. The call to the police station had come an hour ago. What had McFarlane done during the intervening two hours? Clean the flat? Washed and dried the dishes? Rebus looked in the kitchen swing bin, but found no other clues, no broken ornaments, nothing that might hint at a struggle. And if there had been no struggle, if the murderer had gained access to the tenement and to Moira Bitter's flat without forcing an entry, if all this were true... Moira had known her killer. Rebus toured the rest of the flat, but found no other clues. Beside the telephone in the hall stood an answering machine. He played the tape. 
and heard Moira Bitter's voice. Hello, this is Moira. I'm out, I'm in the bath, or I'm otherwise engaged. A giggle. Leave a message and I'll get back to you, unless you sound boring. There was only one message. Rebus listened to it, then wound back the tape and listened again. Hello, Moira, it's John. I got your message. I'm coming over. Hope you're not otherwise engaged. Love you. John McFarlane. Rebus didn't doubt the identity of the caller. Moira sounded fresh and fancy-free in her message. But did McFarlane's response hint at jealousy? Perhaps she had been otherwise engaged when he'd arrived. He lost his temper, blind rage, a knife lying handy. Rebus had seen it before. Most victims knew their attackers. And then some died horribly, with terror in their eyes. The taxis still rumbled past. The night people kept moving. Rebus let his car idle at traffic lights, missing the change to green, only coming to his senses as Amber turned red again. Glasgow Rangers were coming to town on Saturday. There would be casual violence. Rebus felt comfortable with the thought. The worst football hooligan could probably not have stabbed with the same ferocity as Moira Bitter's killer. Rebus lowered his eyebrows. He was rousing himself to fury, keen for confrontation. Confrontation with the murderer himself. John McFarlane was crying as he was led into the interrogation room, where Rebus had made himself look comfortable, cigarette in one hand, coffee in the other. Rebus had expected a lot of things, but not tears. Would you like something to drink? he asked. McFarlane shook his head. Just driving, thinking, Rebus interrupted him. What time was this? Well, said McFarlane, ever since I left work, I suppose. I'm an architect. There's a competition on just now to design a new art gallery and museum complex in Stirling. Our partnership's going in for it. We were discussing ideas most of the day, you know, brainstorming. He looked up at Rebus again, and Rebus nodded. Brainstorm. Now there was an interesting word. And after work, McFarlane continued, I was so fired up I just felt like driving, going over the different options and plans in my head, working out which was strongest. He broke off realizing perhaps that he was talking in a rush, without thought or caution. He swallowed and inhaled some smoke. Rebus was studying McFarlane's clothes. Expensive leather brogues, brown corduroy trousers, a thick white cotton shirt the kind cricketers wore, open at the neck, a tailor-made tweed jacket. We know you did it, John. That's not in dispute. We just want to know why. McFarlane's voice was brittle with emotion. I swear I didn't! I swear! You're going to have to do better than that. Rebus paused again. Tears were dripping onto McFarlane's corduroys. Go on with your story, he said. McFarlane shrugged. That's about it? he said, wiping his nose with the sleeve of his shirt. Rebus prompted him. You didn't stop off anywhere for petrol or a meal or anything like that? He sounded skeptical. And you didn't get hungry? Rebus sounded entirely unconvinced. We'd had a business lunch with a client. We took him to the Irie. After lunch there, I seldom need to eat until the next morning. When did you last see Miss Bitter alive? At the word alive, McFarland shivered. It took him a long time to answer. How long have you known her? About a year. McFarland paused. 
She was Kenneth's girlfriend, he said at last. Kenneth being... McFarland's cheeks reddened before he spoke. My best friend, he said. Kenneth was my best friend. You could say I stole her from him. <sighs> These things happen, don't they? Rebus raised an eyebrow. Do they, he said. McFarland bowed his head again. Can I have a coffee? he asked quietly. Rebus nodded, then lit another cigarette. McFarland sipped the coffee, holding it in both hands like a shipwreck survivor. Rebus rubbed his nose and stretched, feeling tired. You mean, when you got home? McFarland shook his head. No, from the car. I called home from my car phone and got the answering machine to play back any messages. Rebus was impressed. That's clever, he said. Strange. A bit. Did you call her back? Yes. Her answering machine was on. What? McFarlane sounded surprised by the question. Why would anyone want to kill her? McFarlane stared at the table, shaking his head slowly. Go on, said Rebus, sighing, growing impatient. You were saying how you got her message. Well, I went straight to her flat. McFarlane shook his head. But the machine will have logged it, he said. Rebus was more impressed than ever. Technology was a wonderful thing. What's more, he was impressed by McFarlane. If the man was a murderer, then he was a very good one, for he had fooled Rebus into thinking him innocent. It was crazy. There was nothing to point to him not being guilty. But all the same, a feeling was a feeling, and Rebus most definitely had a feeling. I want to see that machine, he said, and I want to hear the message on it. I want to hear Moira's last words. It was interesting how the simplest cases could become so complex. There was still no doubt in the minds of those around Rebus, his superiors and those below him, that John McFarlane was guilty of murder. They had all the proof they needed, every last bit of it circumstantial. McFarlane's car was clean, no blood-stained clothes stashed in the boot, there were no prints on the chopping knife, though McFarlane's prints were found elsewhere in the flat, not surprising, given that he'd visited that night, as well as on many a previous one. No prints either on the kitchen sink and taps, though the murderer had washed a bloody knife. Rebus thought that curious, and as for the motive, jealousy, a falling out, a past indiscretion discovered, the CID had seen them all. Murder by stabbing was confirmed, and the time of death narrowed down to a quarter of an hour either side of three in the morning. McFarlane claimed that at that time he was driving towards Edinburgh, but had no witnesses to corroborate the claim. There was no blood to be found in McFarlane's clothing, but, as Rebus himself knew, that didn't mean the man wasn't a killer. More interesting, however, was that McFarlane denied making the call to the police. Yet someone, in fact whoever murdered Moira Bitter, had made it. And more interesting even than this was the telephone answering machine. Rebus went to McFarlane's flat in Liberton to investigate. The traffic was busy coming into town but quiet heading out. Liberton was one of Edinburgh's many anonymous middle-class districts. Substantial houses, small shops, a busy thoroughfare. It looked innocuous at midnight and was even safer by day. 
What Macfarlane had termed a flat comprised, in fact, the top two stories of a vast detached house. Rebus roamed the building, not sure if he was looking for anything in particular. He found little. Macfarlane led a rigorous and regimented life, and had the home to accommodate such a lifestyle. One room had been turned into a makeshift gymnasium, with weightlifting equipment and the like. There was an office for business use, a study for private use. Don't tell me, Holmes said. Let me guess. You want me to drop everything and run an errand for you. You must be psychic, Brian. Two errands, really. Firstly, last night's calls. Get the recording of them and search for one from John McFarlane, claiming he'd just killed his girlfriend. Make a copy of it and wait there for me. What's the favor you're collecting on? I caught him smoking dope in the lab toilets last month. Holmes laughed. The world's going to pot, he said. Rebus groaned at the joke and put down the receiver. He needed to speak with John McFarlane again. Not about lovers this time, but about friends. Rebus rang the doorbell a third time, and at last heard a voice from within. Jesus! Hold on, I'm coming! A check. I take it you're here about the parking tickets, said Thompson. I'd have got round to them eventually, believe me. It's just that I've been hellish busy, and what with one thing and another... Rebus had followed Thompson into a cluttered room overflowing with bundles of magazines and newspapers. A hi-fi sat in one corner, and covering the wall next to it were shelves filled with cassette tapes. These had an orderly look to them, as though they had been indexed, each tape's spine carrying an identifying number. Thompson, who had been clearing a chair for Rebus to sit on, froze at the detective's words. Dead? he gasped. She was murdered, sir. We think John McFarlane did it. John! Thompson's face was quizzical, then sceptical, then resigned. We don't know that yet, sir. I thought you might be able to help. Of course, I'll help if I can. Sit down, please. Rebus perched on the chair while Thompson pushed aside some newspapers and settled himself on the sofa. You're a writer, I believe, said Rebus. Thompson nodded distractedly. Yes, he said. Freelance journalism, food and drink, travel, that sort of thing. Plus the occasional commission to write a book. What about Mr. McFarlane? No again. We spoke on the telephone a couple of times. It always seemed to end in a shouting match. We used to be like, well, it's a cliché, I suppose, but we used to be like brothers. Yes, said Rebus. So Mr. McFarlane told me. Oh? Thompson sounded interested. What else did he say? Not much, really. Rebus rose from his perch and went to the window, holding aside the net curtain to stare out onto the street below. He said you'd known each other for years, since school, Thompson added. Rebus nodded. And he said you drove a black Ford Escort. That'll be it down there, parked across the street. Was broken into a few months ago, wasn't it? Rebus was examining a pile of magazines on the floor now. I saw the report. They stole your radio and your car phone, Rebus observed, so people could keep in touch, contact him at any time. Is that right? Absolutely right, Inspector. Rebus threw the magazine back onto the pile and nodded slowly. Great things, car phones. He walked over towards Thompson's desk. It was a small flat. This room obviously served a double purpose as study and living room. 
Not that Thompson entertained many visitors. He was too aggressive for many people, too secretive for others. So John McFarlane had said. On the desk there was more clutter, though in some appearance of organization. There was also a neat word processor, and beside it a telephone. And, next to the telephone, sat an answering machine. Yes, Rebus repeated, you need to be in contact. Rebus smiled towards Thompson. Communication, that's the secret. And I'll tell you something else about journalists. What? Unable to comprehend Rebus's direction, Thompson's tone had become that of someone bored with a conversation. He shoved his hands deep into his pockets. Journalists are hoarders. Rebus made this sound like some great wisdom. His eyes took in the room again. I mean, near pathological hoarders. Not at all. Thompson picked up the receiver. Hello? He listened then frowned. Of course, he said finally, holding the receiver out towards Rebus. It's for you, Inspector. Rebus raised a surprised eyebrow and accepted the receiver. It was, as he had known it would be, Detective Constable Holmes. Okay, Holmes said. Costain no longer owes you that favour. He's listened to both tapes. What does that mean? It means, said Holmes, that according to Costain, it's not just a recording, it's the recording of a recording. Rebus nodded, satisfied. Okay, thanks, Brian. He put down the receiver. Good news or bad? Thompson asked. A bit of both, answered Rebus thoughtfully. Thompson had risen to his feet. I feel like a drink, Inspector. It's a bit early for me, I'm afraid, Rebus said, looking at his watch. It was eleven o'clock, opening time. Uh, all right, he said. Just a small one. The whiskey's in the kitchen, Thompson explained. I'll just be a moment. Fine, sir, fine. Rebus listened as Thompson left the room and headed off towards the kitchen. He stood beside the desk, thinking through what he now knew. Then, hearing Thompson returning from the kitchen, floorboards bending beneath his weight, he picked up the waste paper basket from below the desk and, as Thompson entered the room, proceeded to empty the contents in a heap on the sofa. Thompson stood in the doorway, a glass of whiskey in each hand, dumbstruck. What on earth are you doing? he spluttered at last. But Rebus ignored him and started to pick through the now strewn contents of the bin, talking as he searched. It was pretty close to being foolproof, Mr. Thompson. Let me explain. The killer went to Moira Bitter's flat and talked her into letting him in, despite the late hour. He murdered her quite callously. Let's make no mistake about that. I've never seen so much premeditation in a case before. He cleaned the knife and returned it to its drawer. He was wearing gloves, of course, knowing John McFarlane's fingerprints would be all over the flat. And he cleaned the knife precisely to disguise the fact that he had worn gloves. McFarlane, you see, had not. Thompson took a gulp from one glass, but otherwise seemed rooted to the spot. His eyes had become vacant, as though picturing Rebus's story in his mind. McFarlane, Rebus continued, still rummaging, was summoned to Moira's flat. The message did come from her. 
He knew her voice well enough not to be fooled by someone else's voice. The killer sat outside Moira's flat, sat waiting for McFarlane to arrive. Then the killer made one last call, this one to the police, in the guise of a hysterical McFarlane. We know this last call was made on a car phone. The lab boys are very clever that way. The police are hoarders too, you see, Mr. Thompson. We make recordings of emergency calls made to us. It won't be hard to voice print that call and try to match it to John McFarlane. But it won't be John McFarlane, will it? Rebus paused for effect. It'll be you. Thompson gave a thin smile, but his grip on the two glasses had grown less steady and whiskey was dribbling from the angled lip of one of them. Aha! Rebus had found what he was looking for in the contents of the bin. With a pleased as punch grin on his unshaven, sleepless face, he pinched forefinger and thumb together and lifted them for his own and Thompson's inspection. You see, he continued, the killer had to lure McFarlane to the murder scene. Having killed Moira, he went to his car, as I've said. There, he had his portable telephone and a cassette recorder. He was a hoarder. He had kept all his answering machine tapes, including messages left by Moira at the height of their affair. He found the message he needed, and he spliced it. He played this message to John McFarlane's answering machine. All he had to do after that was wait. The glasses collided above his head, shards raining down on him. Thompson had reached the front door, had hauled it open even, before Rebus was on him, lunging, pushing the younger man forward through the doorway and onto the tenement landing. Thompson's head hit the metal rails with a muted chime, and he let out a single moan before collapsing. Rebus shook himself free of glass, feeling one or two tiny pieces nick him as he brushed a hand across his face. He brought a hand to his nose and inhaled deeply. It wasn't enough that Moira had died, died at the hands of someone she knew. McFarlane had to be implicated in her murder. The killer had been out to tag them both. But it was Moira the killer hated. Hated because she had broken a friendship as well as a heart. Rebus stood on the steps of the police station. Thompson was in a cell somewhere below his feet, somewhere below ground level. Confessing to everything. He would go to jail, while John McFarlane, perhaps not realizing his luck, had already been freed. The streets were busy now. Lunchtime traffic, the reliable noises of the everyday. The sun was even managing to burst from its slumber, all of which reminded Rebus that his day was over. Time, all in all, he felt, for a short visit home, a shower, and a change of clothes, and, God and the devil willing, some sleep. Thank you for watching this video. Please like. Share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.